Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Buka, and I'm delighted and honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Daniel Voitas, our speaker today. Dr. Voitas is the inaugural Plummer Innovator keynote speaker, honoring Dr. Henry Plummer, physician, scientist, engineer, and lover of the arts. Dr. Plummer and his colleague Mabel Root designed the Unified Medical Record in 1907, a system still in use today and critical to the integrated multi-specialty multi group practice that is the Mayo Clinic. His interest in design aesthetics is represented by the iconic Plummer Building in Rochester, Minnesota. Dan's career includes a series of firsts and thus very much echoes the innovative and pioneering spirit of the Plummer Award. He earned a PhD in genetics from the Harvard Medical School, supervised by Frederick Ausubel, a renowned pioneer in plant molecular biology. Dan's doctoral work focused on studying transposable elements in plants. Dan then worked as a postdoctoral fellow with me at Johns Hopkins, where his work focused on yeast retrotransposon elements. Uh, and he discovered one of those in one of the first post-genomic analyses ever done. More on that later. In 1992, Dan joined the faculty at Iowa State University, and in his lab there, his work elucidated the detailed molecular mechanisms whereby retrotransposons select chromosomal integration sites from among millions of potential sites that are effectively ignored. Dan was promoted to associate professor in 1997 and to professor in 2001. In 2008, he joined the faculty in the Department of Genetic Cell Biology and Development at the University of Minnesota, and importantly, has led the Interdisciplinary Center for Genome Engineering there, an outgrowth of the earlier Beckman Center that included many members of the Genome Writers Guild. Dan has too many honors to recount, but among the most important was his recent election to the National Academy of Sciences. Dan is best known for his pioneering work to develop methods for precisely altering DNA sequences in living cells, an outgrowth of the transposon work, and enabling detailed functional analysis of genes and genetic pathways. It has enabled efficient methods of targeted genome modification of plants using sequence-specific nucleases. Using zinc finger nucleases, tau effector nucleases and the CRISPR-Cas9 system, Dan has achieved targeted gene knockouts, replacements, and insertions in many plant species. This type of genome modification has applications ranging from understanding gene function to developing crop plants with new valuable traits. His current work is focused on optimizing delivery of nucleases and donor DNA molecules to plant cells uh, to more efficiently target these genetic alterations. His work in this domain has extended well beyond the academic world, and Dan has also excelled as an entrepreneur in the business world, serving for several years now as the Chief Science Officer at Calix Incorporated, where he famously rung the bell at the NASDAQ to celebrate the IPO of that company not something many academics can claim. At a personal level, I have only the fondest memories of Dan and our somewhat brief time together. While Dan was one of the earlier postdocs to join our lab, he stood out in many ways already. For one thing, he was the only postdoc to ever arrive in my lab with a faculty position in his back pocket, saying to me essentially, well, I think I'd like to spend one year working with you before I start as a faculty member in earnest. Although his time was interrupted by several trips to Iowa, he dived into lab culture in earnest and rapidly became proficient in the wet lab, practicing the TYology uh, that our lab uh, excelled at. However, he also brought to my attention the first paper 
on the sequence of an entire eukaryotic chromosome, namely yeast chromosome 3, a favorite of geneticists. He noted with interest a homology to reverse transcriptase reported in the paper, and he decided to dig deep into the sequence. He rapidly discovered that this reverse transcriptase homology was embedded in the bones of a somewhat decrepit but clearly recognizable full-length LTR retrotransposon in what I think must have been the first, uh, one of the first, if not the first, post-genomic analyses uh, ever performed. This element, TY5, ended up being incredibly interesting in the framework of the first part of Dan's academic career. Dan and his students assiduously dissected this element and its biological mechanisms in a series of high profile papers. And to my delight, one of those students, Jun Biao Dai, came to my lab as a postdoc and was one of my best ever. And he now serves as the deputy director of the Institute of Synthetic Biology at the Shenzhen Institutes in China, where he too has excelled. So, in short, I think it is really obvious that Dan has innovated in so many different ways, and he is a highly fitting candidate for this tribute, and I am delighted and honored to introduce him. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Voitas to speak. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, that was a very generous introduction. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate all you've done for me over the years as a as a mentor, a role model, and a really good friend. Um, just to, to sort of set the context for today's talk, you know, Jeff did a great job of talking to you about my history in science. And, you know, I've always loved plants. Uh, son of a forester who grew up in northern Minnesota. I grew up in northern Minnesota. And so I had that connection to the natural world and to plants in particular. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, I went to uh, Harvard Medical School and worked with Fred Ossobel. At the time, there were a handful of new students who joined the lab, and Fred came in with a little Eppendorf tube of seeds and said, this is a Rabidopsis seed, and I want you guys to help make it a, a model plant, um, really focus our resources, make new tools um, to study plant biology around a Rabidopsis, around the Rabidopsis model. And, and of course, at the time, you know, gene discovery was often through transposable elements. A jumping gene would land in, or a, a transposon would land in your gene, cause a phenotype, and you could then clone it because you knew what the transposon was like. And that's why I sought uh, a transposable element in Arabidopsis. And, and I found one, and little did I know at the time that genomes were full of transposons and most were inactive, and, and mine indeed was also non-functional and, and never jumped. Um, but I was following Jeff's word very carefully and both the technology he was developing to advance yeast as a model and of course the focus on transposable elements was really of interest to me and so um, it was a great it was it was a great opportunity to go to Hopkins and spend time with Jeff in his lab and 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 actually work on that transposable element that indeed finally jumped so that was that was a rewarding time um, so also, I, I worked on those transposons for a decade or so, the first decade of my academic career, but I always kind of wanted to get back into plants. And I attended a, a recombination meeting where Dana Carroll was giving a poster on uh, zinc, finger, zinc finger nucleases and their use for gene editing. And I immediately knew that, wow, if, if we could implement gene targeting in plants, there'd be enormous opportunity both in basic biology and, and applications to agriculture. Um, and so um, that was really in 1999, that's really when I began uh, my interest um, in gene editing. So 1999, you know, it took us a long time uh, <laughs> to get where we are today. And really the first 10 years were focused on, on these guys, the reagents that allow gene editing to occur. And we spent a lot of time engineering meganucleases and zinc finger nucleases um, with quite a bit of frustration because it was just often hard to get them to target the sites you wanted to modify. 
And then we developed the first talons with collaborating with Adam Bogdanov. And then shortly thereafter, CRISPR-Cas came. And so the gene targeting problem was really solved uh, with the talons and, and CRISPR-Cas, of course. Um, to frame today's discussion, and I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, implemented um, at Calix. So Jeff mentioned, uh, I helped form this company about 10 years already. And in the last year and a half, we created and introduced into the market the first gene edited uh, food ingredient. Um, and this is a cooking oil from soybean, a healthier cooking oil uh, from soybean. And so why did we edit soybean to improve uh, soybean oil? Well, uh, this slide shows the fatty acid composition of a variety of plant oils. Um, you can see that soybean oil is fairly low in monounsaturated fats. Um, and um, it, it'd be much more desirable if it were higher in monounsaturated fats, like the heart healthy canola and olive oils. And, and also um, because it has high polyunsaturated fats, it's often unstable, uh, has a lower shelf life and you can't fry as long, you know, your French fries as long in, in soybean oil. And so what um, food manufacturers have done over the years was to chemically treat soybean oil, hydrogenate it, get rid of, um, increase the fraction of, get rid of the polyunsaturated fats and increase the fraction of monounsaturated fats. Um, and indeed it did extend shelf life, improve heat stability, but it gave rise to these trans fatty acids, which the FDA about two years ago now has banned from the US diet. So, you know, Calix focuses on making and using gene editing uh, to improve food, make healthier uh, food ingredients. And so we applied our technology um, to, to uh, overcome this negative uh, consumer attribute, namely the need to hydrogenate soybean oil. Um, and we also simultaneously benefited the farmer. Um, so this slide just shows once the FDA started demanding labeling of trans fatty acids, you can see that over the years, um, the demand for soybean oil decreased and soybean was replaced with other oils, um, including palm oil, for example, which is grown in the tropics, um, has negative environmental consequences because it leads to a lot of deforestation when you make palm plantations and then you have to import it in, into the US, which of course is not environmentally um, sound. Um, and so, and we also wanted to provide benefit to the Minnesota and upper Midwest farmers who grow soybean as a commodity. So the gene editing we performed was pretty straightforward. Um, this is just the biosynthetic pathway of fatty acids. And we targeted for knockout um, two fatty acid desaturases um, that are expressed um, in the seed of, of soybean. So the idea is you'd, if you could knock out these fatty acid desaturases, you would accumulate this monounsaturated fats and you know, reduce the amount of polyunsaturated fats. Um, and indeed, we were able to do that. Um, up here is shown the high oleic soybean um, oil that, that we produced at at, at Calix, and it's much more akin now to sunflower and olive oil in terms of its fatty acid composition. And indeed, it does have a longer shelf life, uh, improved uh, frying um, and, and heat stability. Um, so uh, this is just one very simple example of a two gene knockout that can create a trait of interest. But in my title, I. I, my title is about the promise of plant gene editing at scale. That is, I would like to use soybean as a chassis to produce all of these oils, from safflower to palm to sunflower, uh, you name it, why not? Soybean's a great sustainable crop. It captures nitrogen from the atmosphere. You don't need to fertilize it. And you know, why do we ship uh, these oils all around the world? Uh, when we could just engineer soybean uh, to make them for us. Um, wheat could be a chassis for carbohydrate production, perhaps pea for plant-based proteins to optimize the production of plant-based proteins. But 
in order to undertake these challenges, again, we need to perform plant genome editing more frequently, more efficiently, and make more sophisticated edits. So those are, you know, carbohydrates, oils, proteins, those are all primary uh, metabolites. You know, we still, if we want to fully capture the promise of gene editing in plants, you know, there are other applications. Um, these are just a couple of projects funded by the Gates Foundation, which of course recognizes moonshots and invests in them. You know, they're trying to get, you know, soybean, I mentioned, captures nitrogen from the atmosphere naturally. Um, they would like to convert monocots like wheat and corn um, to have symbioses with um, soil bacteria so that they can also capture ni atmospheric nitrogen and, and reduce the need for fertilizers. Um, I've been an advisor now for many years to the Rice C4 project. Some plants perform photosynthesis much more efficiently. Um, and, but if you're going to convert an inefficient plant like rice to perform C4, efficient C4 photosynthesis, it's going to require a lot of changes to plant architecture and biochemistry. So both of these projects really, in order to be enabled, are going to require more sophisticated ways to edit plant genes. So why haven't we got there? What's, you know, what's, what's the hold back? What's, the, what's keeping us from achieving this, this um, goal in plants? Well, I think this slide does a really good job of summarizing it. And it came out of a, a, a meeting. It was the National Science Foundation uh, convened a meeting of plant scientists to, to think about what's needed in order to really capitalize on the opportunity of, of gene editing. And they recognized on the left here that big investments have been made, been made in terms of uh, reading genomes, sequencing genomes, determining metabolic profiles, RNA profiles. And so the hypotheses that are generated really you know, can be tested, but the bottlenecks, plant regeneration and delivering gene editing reagents to plant cells are, are really preventing um, the advancement of uh, new knowledge in plant science and the harnessing of this new knowledge to, to improve um, agriculture. So as luck would have it, a few years ago, I had a handful of new graduate students uh, enter to the lab and, and I wanted to challenge them with, um, you know, taking on a big problem. And that is what, what can we do in our lab to reduce, to eliminate or reduce these bottlenecks? So we can advance uh, plant gene editing um, at scale. So the first story is about plant uh, regeneration. And so just as a bit of background, um, actually the, the way that we de deliver DNA and RNA and protein reagents to plant cells really hasn't changed much in decades. Um, so we have cells that are grown in culture, we incubate them with the soil bacterium, agrobacteria, agrobacterium, which transfers some of its DNA into the cells, or we use biolistics, we coat um, uh, metal particles with DNA or RNA and blast them into the cells. And at some frequency, our reagents, our DNA gets incorporated into the genome. And then we grow those cells in an undifferentiated state and then apply hormones to induce first shoots and then roots and then ultimately a transgenic uh, or a gene edited plant. So this process is a bottleneck and because um, many plants are not conducive to transformation um, as outlined here. Um, and even within a given species, for example, there are some soybean varieties that you can transform and regenerate, but there are others that are just very much recalcitrant to transformation. And oftentimes this process leads to unwanted changes in the genome. Mutations occur, chromosome rearrangements occur, the epigenome can be altered. So it's really not desirable. And so um, I told, when I met with the students, uh, we had a, a lab meeting and I said, let's get away from these decades old techniques. Let's get away from as much as possible from the need to go through transgenic intermediates and perform tissue culture. So uh, today's talk is really the story of three of those students. And, and, the, and the first part of the talk is the story of uh, Michael and Ryan, um, who used, um, as you'll see, developmental regulators 
um, to, to really accelerate uh, plant genome. And, and that'll become clear here in, in, a, in a moment. So Brian and Michael focused their attention on uh, this stem cell niche in plants called the meristem. And these are the cells at the plant apex. Um, and they grow, divide, and differentiate into all of the above ground organs, so leaves and flowers, for example. Um, and over the years, we've come to understand many of the, the important drivers of um, meristem initiation and maintenance. So for example, there are transcription factors like Wuschel and Clavada 3, which are key for meristem um, identity and, and maintenance. And these are transcription factors that can move from cell to cell. And also they interact with plant hormones, cytokinins, or, or work to, in concert with plant hormones like cytokinins to maintain uh, the, these stem cells. And people over the years have taken some of these factors and overexpressed them ectopically in plants. And you do see some sort of nascent meristems that, that can emerge. Um, but uh, the challenge that Michael and Ryan took on uh, was to see if they could induce a meristem, induce a shoot, and if they co-deliver these developmental regulators along with genetic engineering reagents, they should be able to induce a gene edited shoot. And that shoot could then give rise to flower seed and transmit um, the genetic changes uh, to the next generation. So um, Ryan uh, recognized that, you know, it might not be that easy to identify which developmental regulators and which combinations of developmental regulators are necessary to induce meristems. And so he sort of set up a, a, a system to screen at relatively high throughput these different combinations in order to optimize the reagents that we would need to induce a meristem. So the first set of experiments use constructs similar to the one um, at the top here, a luciferase reporter, and then, um, you know, Wuschel or shoot meristemless or a gene that synthesizes cytokinin like isopentanyl transferase. And then under weak or strong promoters, because it was uncertain what dosage of these regulators would be needed to, to induce uh, the meristems. So we made these constructs. He introduced them into agrobacterium, our favorite reagent uh, in, in delivery, um, our, our bacterium for re reagent delivery. He treated the culture to induce expression of the virulence genes, which promote transfer. And then he would put seedlings in six well plates, and then incubate them with the agrobacterium. And then you could see transfer in, into the tissue uh, by, which could be visualized uh, by luminescence from the luciferase. And so uh, what he observed, so here in the top, you see a couple of seedlings and circled in red are, you know, tissue that's highly transformed based on the luciferase reporter. What we did see over time is that some of the cells formed these dark green nodules and then ultimately formed what looked like a leaf primordia. So he could, he could see the, the beginnings of, of meristem formation in organogenesis. And then over time, again, with certain combinations, um, he would see young shoots form. So this is a, the seedling that was treated it's a little distorted because it's been growing in liquid, but you can see these little shoots emerging um, from the cotyledons in this case. And so Ryan would excise these shoots, um, induce roots to form, and then ultimately they would grow. He could transfer them out into soil. And so these are some examples of plants that he created. Um, this plant number two happens to be a transgenic plant. So this method can be used to create transgenic plants. That's illustrated by the uh, luciferase activity in the leaf punches, but also it's ectopically expressing these developmental regulators. So you can see it's phenotypically abnormal compared to this non-transgenic plant uh, that he created below. And I think this is an important point though, is that this plant is non-transgenic 
and it was yet induced, and meristem was induced from those um, infected seedlings. So what this suggests is the developmental regulators went into some cells, some cells became transgenic, expressed them, they moved into adjacent cells and then induced a meristem that was non-transgenic. So uh, these transgenic plants could be grown, they have flower. Um, what's shown here in this six well plate are luminescent seedlings, so they transmitted uh, the transgene to the next generation. And so uh, this turned out to be uh, an effective method, at least, um, to make transgenic plants in this Nicotiana benthamiana, a, a species of tobacco that we use um, as our model. So um, through this method, uh, Ryan could then kind of optimize which combinations and which promoters are best for inducing um, these shoots. And so this is sort of a summary of, of his data. You can see that he really didn't, he only treated, you know, on average 30 to 40 seedlings, which are in, in black. And then Wuschel and IPT and Wuschel and shoot meristemless gave high numbers of growths, shoot-like growths, and then also full plants. So on average, one out of three treated seedlings would ultimately give rise to a full plant, which is really a, a really pretty good frequency by all accounts. So Ryan also wanted to determine if he could do perform uh, gene editing. And so he then, once, once the regulators were optimized, uh, he then added Cas9 and a guide RNA. Um, and this particular guide RNA targets a gene in carotenoid biosynthesis. So if the gene is inactivated, carotenoids aren't produced and the chlorophyll gets broken down due to photobleaching. So there provides a visible uh, readout for mutations. So this is some really early work. This is one of these meristems that's being induced still in the early stage. Uh, of course, you know, Ryan was excited, harvested the tissue and looked to see if in fact editing was occurring. Um, and indeed, as measured by this loss of a restriction enzyme site, the upper band represents fragments, DNA fragments that have undergone editing, uh, consequently, in our um, inactivating that restriction enzyme site. And the editing was also then confirmed as shown below by next generation sequencing. Um, these growths were allowed to progress and plants were formed. So these are different plants and leaf tissue was harvested. The target site PCR amplified and subjected to next generation sequencing. And you can see that these plants are chimeric. So in purple are the fraction of reeds that contain um, edits at the target site. Uh, so the real question, of course, is do these chimeric plants transmit uh, the edit uh, to the next generation? Um, and indeed they do. So if you look on the right, these are progeny from one of those plants. Um, some are wild type, some are completely albino. Now there are two targets, phytoene desaturase, so uh, two genes and two alleles for each gene. So Four targets had to have knockout mutations in order to, to give this phenotype. Um, these are heterozygous plants that still carry, that are transgenic for the reagents. So gene editing is ongoing, giving rise to the modeled phenotype. And the picture on the left is just to illustrate that some of the shoots that emerged right from the get-go were, had biallelic knockouts and phytoene desaturase. And of course, these, these shoots never uh, really went very far because they lacked photosynthetic uh, capacity. So Ryan could make transgenic plants, he could make gene edited plants through this approach. And a lot of the focus now has been to move beyond the, the tobacco model, the Nicotiana benthamiana model. And so um, in this regard, he's most recently had success in, in tomato. Again, he can grow tomato seedlings and identify the combinations of regulators that give the best and the highest number of shoot-like growths. He can see um, luminescent uh, meristems form, and so they're transgenic, and he can recover whole plants. Uh, more recently, he, he made a, a plant that has gene edits and this Psi1 gene. Um, this gene is involved in producing the red pigments in, in, the, in the ripe tomato. Um, so, uh, this, he created this plant. He wasn't sure if it had mutations, but 
the fruit was yellow and remained yellow and never turned red. And so indeed, when he analyzed the DNA, he'd made a, a biallelic knockout of this gene um, early on in, in development, which persisted through the plant and, and could be transmitted uh, to the next generation. So that's Ryan's story. Uh, Michael, the other student who was working on this approach, um, wanted to sidestep the need to, to grow the seedlings aseptically entirely. He wanted to work, he wanted to see if he can induce edited meristems on soil grown plants. So his approach was to take a soil grown plant and remove the apex and then deliver the editing reagents um, to, the, to, to the node, basically, the nascent node. And the hope was that the developmental regulators would induce a shoot and the editing reagents would uh, create mutations such that an edited shoot would emerge and transmit uh, mutations um, through the seed. So his approach was very similar. Some of the initial experiments used a luciferase reporter and different combinations of the developmental regulators. And when they were, this is an example of um, the types of shoots that emerged from these trimmed back plants. Um, actually, you know, when you prune a plant, its natural tendency is to create um, new shoots uh, to produce the, apa, apa, you know, the, uh, ultimately the flowers um, and to take over the missing um, apical meristem. And so the there's first 20 days or so, uh, Michael just removed shoots that were wild type, but then after about 20 days, you could start to see uh, luminescent uh, shoots emerge. Um, and then if he added uh, gene editing reagents, um, he indeed was able to identify shoots that had undergone gene editing. So the box here represents the site of injection, and you can see this kind of funny distorted shoot that's emerging. Um, and this is the tissue that he sampled for gene editing. You can see it's also luminescent. So the distorted phenotype is probably due to that ectopic expression of those developmental regulators. Uh, this plant is much more phenotypically normal. Again, injection occurred down here, tissue was harvested here. And if you look um, on the gel, you can see that indeed a restriction enzyme site uh, was, was lost due to um, mutagenesis and of course, uh, the gene, gene targeting, the uh, targeted mutagenesis was confirmed by, by DNA sequencing. So some of the shoots that emerged when the gene editing reagents were delivered were albino, uh, some cases chimeric, some places entirely um, albino. And this is consistent with, again, a biallelic knockout of this phytoene desaturase gene. Um, which is important for uh, pigment production and persistence. So these white tissue could also be sampled and tested, and indeed the biallelic mutations could be confirmed by either gel-based assays or next-generation sequencing. Um, it was clear that um, these completely um, edited shoots uh, could be produced. So. You know, we started, we regretted a little bit the choice of our, our, our gene target because these shoots when completely edited like this could never uh, persist very well and grow and, and um, set seed. Um, however, some chimeric shoots we were able to recover um, seed from. So this is a great example here. You can see in the background, there's this completely albino tissue and you can see this stretch of albino tissue that pretty much ends in this seed pod. Um, and when the seed was harvested and germinated, it gave rise to 100% uh, white seedlings. And so um, we, we genotype those, of course, and we genotype some of that parental tissue. So this is phytoene desaturase one and phytoene desaturase two. You can see it is indeed chimeric. So you get a wide variety of mutations um, at different frequencies. But in the next generation, it, they really sort out and, and you only transmit a, a subset of those. And again, uh, the genotype matched the phenotype. These were indeed knockout mutations. If you look a little further up on this plant, this is a pretty much an entirely green sector that flowered and set seed. And here we see segregation 
of three to one in the next generation as illustrated here. So a th you know, three quarters of them are green and, and, and one quarter um, are albino. And again, uh, genotype matches phenotype. One of the alleles is a biallelic knockout. And so we're really just looking at a head, the other allele being heterozygous um, and segregating. Um, there's this 48 base pair deletion, which still seems to retain phytoene to saturase activity because whenever it's present, present, you have a green, green seedling. So again, uh, genotype um, matches phenotype. And so this is just one of my favorite pictures, a plant in which reagents were injected at two sites, giving rise to two albino shoots, one developmentally distorted because it, it, the gene editing reagents persist and another phenotypically normal, except for the, of course, the, the lo loss of chlorophyll due to the mutation. And uh, Michael and a former undergraduate, Macy Fulbrecht, along with help from Ryan, um, has, has started to, again, try this technique in other plants. One of our colleagues, uh, Matt Clark, is interested in editing in grape, and we've been able to create transgenic grape shoots. Potato seems particularly amenable uh, to this technique. So these are transgenic potato shoots in, induced by this method. And we continue to expand the species out, again, trying to make this technology more useful and, and move it outside of, of the Nicotiana, the tobacco model. So that was the story of two students focusing on overcoming this bottleneck, the regeneration bottleneck. Uh, the next story I want to tell is one on reagent delivery. Um, and this was conducted by uh, my student, uh, Evan Ellison, and some of this work was just published a few weeks ago. And this approach uses, rather than agrobacterium, or rather than particle bombardment, it uses plant viruses to deliver gene editing reagents. And so the folks in the audience who work on mammalian systems or, uh, you know, this might come as a surprise to you, but plant viruses really have not been developed as vectors for reagent delivery. There are a few vectors, RNA virus vectors, that can deliver pro for protein production or uh, to deliver small RNAs, which induce silencing of, of native genes. Um, but really, I think it, there's a lot of potential here that's been um, untapped. So this slide is just an example of um, you know, an RNA virus. This happens to be foxtail mosaic virus. A lot of the experiments I'm going to talk about are on with tobacco rattle virus. But basically, like most viruses, the genome is very compact. Um, there are subgenomic promoters that drive the expression of some of the protein products. And you can duplicate these promoters, as illustrated here, and insert your cargo um, in front of one of them um, in order to have it expressed um, through infection. A limitation to these vectors is that the cargo capacity is limited, so you really can't deliver like Cas9 and guide RNAs. Simply, anything over a KB tends to get tends to recombine out. So we've been thinking about this for a while, and actually published a paper um, with Magdi Mafus's lab from Kaust in Saudi Arabia, and Dinesh Kumar, who continues to be a collaborator. Um, and he's at UC Davis. And the strategy here was to make a transgenic plant. So, okay, we're, we haven't completely gotten rid of tissue culture here because we have to start off with a transgenic plant that expresses Cas9. And then we use our RNA viruses to express the guide RNAs. They're small and easily maintained by these vectors. So as the virus spreads through the plant, editing occurs. And the hope is that some of the guide RNAs will make it to the meristem where flowers are produced and then transmit the mutations to the next generation. And we, we were very successful in the somatic editing part, but the frequency with which uh, you know, vertical transmission occurred was very low and really not satisfactory. And so um, Evan reasoned that you know, 
we, we really don't need the virus to get to the meristem because viruses are often excluded from plant meristems. We just need the guide to get to the meristem. Cas9 should already be there. And so he added to the guide RNAs, RNA sequences that promote cell-to-cell -cell mobility. So one of these is flowering time. Flowering time is made in the leaves. Um, it moves up the meristem and it actually is important in triggering flowering. Um, there are other RNAs um, uh, with like tRNAs and, and, and RNAs with tRNA-like motifs that can move from cell to cell. And so we focused on flowering time and our collaborator, Dinesh Kumar, focused on um, some of the tRNAs as well as flowering time. So yeah, this is the strategy. Just add um, these, Hair, these flowering time or tRNA sequences to the end of the guide, most of them form a hairpin, infect the plants and see what happens. So first of all, the, the first question was, does the augmentation, does the addition of these sequences impact or affect uh, guide RNA function? So these are, so what Evan did was in, in, infiltrate a leaf, deliver the virus to the leaf and then um, wait a while and then pick a leaf higher up on the plant and look, PCR up the target locus and look for frequencies of gene editing. And as you can see here, um, really it's very good from over 50 to almost 100%. This is the phytoindosaturase locus, this is the A gamma locus. Um, and he using FT uh, mut and mutant FT, so it, it has a mutation in the start codon, so it's only the RNA and 102 bases, bases of FT that uh, form a hairpin-like structure. And none of them seem to impact editing efficiency. What was interesting is that as these plants grew, you could see signs of gene editing occurring. So Evan would take this plant out and take a picture every few days. And these white sectors are not due to virus infection. They're actually, again, the, the knockout of the phytoene desaturase target. Um, and then as these plants grew, some of them produced these completely white um, inflorescences that then transmitted the mutations to the next generation and at remarkable frequency. So here's phytoene desaturase and A gammas, and we're seeing 60 to 90% of the seeds that are produced have uh, mutations. And this just slide further illustrates how these mobile mobility sequences um, promote mutagenesis. So here he has different plants that have been treated and then he harvests a number of progen another seed, genotypes them, and this plant gave rise to seedlings that all had biallelic mutations um, in the target. So light green is uh, a heterozygous, uh, dark green homozygous, and uh, the yellow color is wild type. So these two had augmentations and you see a lot more green compared to, compared to the wild type. Now, I mentioned that, you know, when we did basically this experiment before, we only got like a fraction of a percent um, transmission of mutations. And here we're looking at, you know, almost 25% in some of these plants. So we, we, we think we know why uh, this is the case. Um, and it depends, where uh, in the development of the inflorescence, the flower bearing stem that you harvest uh, the seeds. So this is a slide from our collaborator Dinesh. And this is the very, one of the very first flowers that's produced. And you see very few white seedlings. This is a pod from the middle of the flower bearing stem and you see more. And a pod from the top and you see in some cases they're completely biallelic mutations. And so this, this slide just sort of quantifies it, seed pod one to seed pod 10. Uh, the wild type is in um, orange. And in those initial studies, we harvested always the very first seed pods or the first few seed pods. So that's probably why the mutagenesis was so low. Um, these in purple and blue are frequencies of mutagenesis uh, produced with guides that have those mobility sequences. So there's clearly a timing, um, that's, timing is key uh, to maximize immunogenesis um, as well. So uh, the final experiment uh, I'd like to tell you about is one of multiplexing, that is targeting uh, multiple loci uh, simultaneously. Um, and we weren't 
really sure if this was going to work, um, but we, we have a subgenomic viral promoter expressing, in this case, basically three guides in tandem, separated by you know, four base pair cloning sites. This construct has spacer sequences of 23 or so bases to separate the guides. And these have complete um, tRNA sequences, which actually are processed by the cellular enzymes and excised. So in this construct, you should be, have released three individual guides. Um, so this is a procedure developed or a technique developed by Inang Yang's lab um, at Penn State that, that's, that's been widely used, um, particularly in plants. Um, and so um, uh, the next data is from this um, spacer construct. And these are progeny of plants that were infected with that spacer construct. And in yellow are those that have mutations. So you can see, you know, three out of 10 had mutations in all three targets. So even though those guides were all on a single transcript, Cas9 could grab all three of them, bring them to the target and create mutations. Um, and, you know, it's really only one out of 10 in this case, that was wild type. So our guides are phytoene desaturase and two sites in agamus. And these sites are about 4 kb apart. And so in some cases, we're also able to create deletions through infection. So Evan grabbed primers that were flank outside of the cut site, amplified in the wild type. And then you can see these guys the four, have lost that 4 kb intervening sequence. So uh, we were really surprised by the high frequency with which we could create mutations through multiplexing. And then finally, I just walked through a, a little bit more of this data. Um, these are frequencies of mutagenesis, heritable mutagenesis, when you express, when you use viruses that express single guides. Um, if you do a mixed infection, interestingly, only, you never see more than one locus hit. So we think that really only one of the viruses can really establish the infection and, and, and once one takes over, the others can't, can't gain ground and, and infect the same cells. And then these are the tRNA architecture, the spacer architecture, and basically the direct repeat architecture. And here you see frequencies in which one gene was edited, two genes were edited, or all three were edited. And so really all architectures gave outcomes, multiplexed outcomes, Perhaps the spacer based on some of them were highly variable, but this the error bars are a little bit better for the spacer architecture. Um, and so we're, we're trying to see how far we can push this um, and whether or not uh, we can make additional improvements um, to the vectors to improve the editing efficiency. <clears throat> but, you know, when we talk about genome editing at scale, I mean, in one generation of infection, you can make a, quite a variety of of genetic variation. And if you infect these plants again and again and again in a few generations, uh, you can really introduce um, a lot of variation in, in, a hand, in a wide number of genes. So this is just my last slide, my summary. Uh, my introductory slide as well as my summary slide. Um, and you know, these bottlenecks, you know, we've made some improvements and in terms of regeneration and reagent delivery, I think there's still a lot of opportunity to sort of think about, think outside of the box of traditional ways of making gene edited plants. And hopefully we can continue to open those bottlenecks so that we can really capture the opportunities um, that gene editing provides. Uh, I'd just like to make uh, a few acknowledgements. So Michael and Ryan did the story of um, delivery of developmental regulators with contributions from my lab manager, uh, Colby, and not shown here, an undergraduate, uh, Macy. And then Evan is the one who spearheaded the RNA virus work, uh, collaborating with Dinesh Kumar's lab and with help from uh, Elena Gamma, a technician of the lab. So that pretty much wraps up my talk. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Hey, Dan. All right, so we have some questions in the Q&A, which I'm gonna go ahead and, do you have your panel up for the Q&A? I do. Okay, so it looks like this top one. Yep, would, would, right. 
would the technology work in monocots? Um, we are indeed trying the RNA virus approach um, in monocots. Um, we haven't really focused so much on using the developmental regulators to induce edited marrow stems in monocots. This is in part because Bill Gordon Cam's lab at Corteva has, has done sort of a similar approach, delivering developmental regulators that um, induce not marrow stem formation, but the formation of somatic embryos. So th that was one of the reasons why we really initiated the studies on dicots to see if developmental regulators also had opportunity there for editing. Um, let's see. For viral vectors, have you tried expressing the guide RNA in the transgenic plant and then delivering Cas9 on the RNA virus? I would expect prolonged expression of the Cas9 in the transgenic plant could lead to nonspecific promiscuous activity. Um, the, the problem with, it's a, it's a nice idea, but the problem is that Cas9 is just too big for these RNA virus vectors. Um, it's really about one KB cargo capacity. Now there was just a paper like last week, maybe in Nature Plants that used negative strand RNA viruses and were able to express Cas9 and the guide. So as I mentioned, I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity um, in using RNA viral vectors and perhaps the solution will be negative strand RNA viruses for, for delivering larger proteins. Uh, how would regulatory evaluations in the US handle these types of multiplexed edits? That's a good question. Um, so I think, well, you know, it's great for basic biology because you could really explore different, you could create lots of different mutations and combinations of mutations and, and, and test their outcomes. And then, and then uh, perhaps you would use a, a more conventional approach if you wanted to introduce those mutations into something that would go out into the field. But of course, you could also then, you know, th there are ways to ensure that you haven't wreaked too much havoc to the genome, like just sequence the genome, for example, and see if there are other um, off-target hits. I think, yeah, um, you also, I think, a, a Another concern along these lines is you're going to want to make sure that that virus is not transmitted because you don't want uh, a virus in, in the product that you would ultimately uh, deliver to the field. So could delivering the gene editing components via agrobacterium instead of direct injection increase transformation and editing efficiency? Uh, yeah, so I probably wasn't very clear on that. So. The direct injection involved injecting agrobacterium. So we didn't just deliver naked uh, DNA um, to the sites where we pruned off the apex. So indeed, we're still relying, in both approaches, we're still um, relying on agrobacterium to deliver the editing reagents. So. I think that's, uh, regarding delivery, did you try nanoparticles? And what do you think about them? Uh, we uh, have had conversations with Marquita Landry's lab, who's really been publishing some nice work on the use of nanoparticles, but we haven't really gotten any experiments off the ground. Um, did a, a, a few test experiments, but I think that's a, a very interesting approach uh, for sure. Um, which, again, is, is different from agrobacterium and biolistics and appears to be very promising. So let's see. Can you explain a bit further the details of homing the guide RNA to the meristems by, your, by the mRNAs expressed? So... Um, so the tRNA-like sequences, well, flowering time, the flowering time RNA, which is produced in the leaf, makes its way um, through the vasculature to the meristem. And there's been a lot in, you know, a lot of people have studied that RNA uh, for its impact on inducing flower induction. The tRNA-like sequences, uh, it's a little less clear. I mean, in both cases, it's, it's still, we don't know a lot about the mechanisms of transport and movement. 
the tRNA-like sequences seem to promote cell-to-cell -cell mobility, but by what mechanism? Uh, again, it's 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 not certain, and I don't think we've really distinguished um, also whether or not by adding those sequences we're just getting well. We actually do seem to see more virus, so maybe we're just uh, promoting viral movement and getting a better infection by adding those sequences as opposed to targeting directly uh, to the meristem. I think we need, I still think we need to do some work on that. So, and one last question: Can you please speak to how repair pathways differ across plant species? and efforts to favor repair pathway choice? Well, uh, I think in general, um, you know, it's end joining that predominates and, um, you know, homologous recombination uh, is very infrequent in, you know, in, in elevated perhaps in, in, in the dividing cells. We've, we've tried to, um, influence repair pathway choice through by using mutation you know, mutag mutations in like the end joining pathway, and we do see more homology directed repair when we knock out KU, for example, which is important for end joining, but um, but it was only a few fold. So uh, I you know I think that's it's it's a really good question and and probably another bottleneck that should be put on the list. Um, M methods and mechanisms to make more precise sequence changes. Base editors will certainly be helpful, but homology dependent repair for some will be, uh, for some types of changes might well be needed. So, okay, I guess we're coming up. Uh, one last one Meristem induction tried in any tree species yet? Um, not by us. Um, but since we published that paper, a lot of people have requested uh, the reagents and some of them interested in, in editing trees. So hopefully it'll be applied and hopefully it'll be successful. Okay, thank you very much. I'll turn it over to you again, Kit.